a warm evening, not unlike any other in Tewkesbury, a man is driving home from work. He lives not far from a few of the area's larger businesses, including a delivery center. Just as he crosses the railroad between the forest and the center, something catches his eye. In the dim light of the evening sun, as the rails vanish into the woodwork, the creature stands. It is a fleeting moment, but one the man finds will repeat itself often, around the same time, each evening. The creature is wolf-like, but not a wolf. Its fur, even in the dark night air, is clearly silver in color. It is not any animal the driver recognizes. All he knows for sure is that its home is on, or near, the northernmost railway. Hannah Daly is a resident of Tewkesbury, Massachusetts. Although she is a recent addition to the area, she has already caught wind of a strange story. They are silver, they are slightly larger than a coyote, but not larger than a wolf, and at one point will heal this blood. Sightings of strange canines are not uncommon in New England. Sightings of out-of-place coyotes, wolves, and even dog-wolf hybrids happen with relative consistency, and generally aren't doubted. The mention of Wahila, though, is something more mysterious. The word Wahila was first made popular by the late cryptozoologist Ivan T. Sanderson in his article, The Dire Wolf. In the passage, Sanderson makes references to sightings of strange great white wolves in northern Michigan and the Nahani Valley in Canada, and in particular, a sighting reported to him by a man named Frank Graves. He described it, and he said that it was, by this time, no more than 20 paces away, as an enormous white wolf with very long, rather shaggy hair but with a very wide head, and standing about three feet. Frank's American Indian friend said that these animals were much larger than any wolf. They were loners, avoided real wolves, had smaller ears and much wider heads, and rather short legs, with splayed feet, were very thick and more like those of otters, while they were scavengers rather than predacious animals. He also said that they were comparatively rare and lived near the tundra, but that they sometimes came down. Yet he also affirmed that they were to be found all the time in this valley and in some others. The American Indians know nothing of fossil bone, but they persist in their stories of the Wahila, and they insist that it is indeed a dire wolf of As the title suggests, Sanderson postulated an extinct type of canine may have survived to the present day, becoming the culprit behind Wahila sightings. A canine relative, which shares its genetics with both dogs and bears, called Amphision. Sanderson certainly had some interest in the fossil relative or fossil relic species side of the entire Wahila phenomenon. And Amphision in particular is a uh, is an interesting sort of analog for Wahila reports. Amphision was this genus, it wasn't just a singular species, it was a genus of what we refer to as bear dogs, which are this late Pleistocene genus, this group of animals, that were characterized by a lot of commonalities that we see in canines and in ursines today, and they're believed to have potentially been a common ancestor. Their body type really allowed them to have this very wide, successful survival range. They lasted from about 17 million years ago to about 2.5 million years ago. And what's more, these predators, which were quite successful up until the end of the Pleistocene, were characterized as well by the certain body types that were really, again, very analogous for Wahila settings. We have these very 
canine-like appearances, but a bit more robust, very large build with these very wide heads and snouts, and even very long tails, which again, Sanderson did report that the Wahila was said to have a longer tail, almost like that of an otter, which is a really great comparison with the tail of some of the amphisions. So these, this group of animals is really kind of, anatomically speaking, a really good match for what people talk about in Wahila reports. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are the answer to Wahila reports or that this is evidence of living amphisions, but it's very interesting that the similarities are uh, kind of specific in that way. The description given in Sanderson's article is oddly similar to the general look of Amphision, particularly in the long tail. In more recent times, it has been theorized that Wahila sightings may be accounted for by a different prehistoric canine, the real direwolf. Even though it is still often referred to as Canis dearus, the dire wolf, as it's commonly known, this extinct species of canine, is actually thought to be separate from the Canis genus, meaning that it's actually quite separated from a lot of the modern canines and even the extinct canines. It's also a much more recent fossil relative than a lot of the other amphisions because it is classified as a type of amphision to some extent, bearing the name Anisian dearus. It was very, very wolf-like in appearance, but again is, is much more recent, having come on the scene around 125,000 years ago, and lasting perhaps until only about 9,500 years ago. So again, very recent competitor with a lot of other extinct mammals, something that would have been competing with things like the Smilodon, or modern humans even. So it's much more available in recent memory, and in that way, has been suggested as an analog for the Wahila. And of course, the term dire wolf has also become popular in a lot of media that's either fantasy, such as Game of Thrones, or in Sanderson's case, as a descriptor instead of an actual species analog, him having called his article on the Wahila the dire wolf. Could Canis dirus, Amphision, or some other uncatalogued kind of canine be the Wahila of Tewksbury? Like, open, like, trailless area? Yeah, this is all where it opens up, you're right. Okay, this is, this is probably our spot, yeah. Oh, wow, look at that! Damn, like, you can see... pad, and then almost like the, uh... Partial digit, front, some kind of, yeah. Something's been kicked up here. This is significant. This is really important. This is clear evidence that this is a predator because check out what we just found in the fecal matter. A jawbone. Tiny little jawbone. You see that? Yep. Look at that. So this, this, we, this is like absolutely beyond any doubt the game trail. This is it right here. This is where things are bringing food to eat. This is where they're marking territory by dropping their fecal matter. This is where they're killing things to eat later. Around dusk, you said, right now. So yeah, like 7.30, 8.30 p.m. between okay, those so general hours. There's still some light, and that's like recent. So we're not talking right. at winter when it's like pitch black by 8 o'clock. No. We're talking yeah. there's still light. Yeah. Although the mystery wolf was not seen that night, Daly and company did establish a predator uses the railroad as a game trail. The question now is what kind of predator? Even though our nighttime investigation didn't yield the results that we were hoping for, especially considering how consistent these sightings are supposed to be, we did find some interesting details. A particular track that we found, which struck us very immediately as being some kind of canid, we discovered was just a dead ringer for the track of a silver fox, which are very common in Massachusetts. 
And really, it makes sense because the scat that we found, the, the fecal matter, it also contains very small bone fragments, meaning that whenever left that fecal matter is a predator that, while is using that game trail, isn't really the size of what we're looking for. It's smaller, it's, it's probably still feeding on small rodents, and really that's, again, a dead ringer for the silver fox. In discussions that we unfortunately had to have off camera with the individual, Hannah's friend who is seeing these strange canines, we, we discussed the possibility that this was a silver fox, and he proclaimed it, it just didn't match up with a silver fox. So what we did was we actually formed a diagram here to kind of help try and display to him what it could be that he's seeing based on just shape without trying to outright say, is it a fox? Is it a wolf? Is it a coyote? Etc. Etc. In numeric order, the actual animals the silhouette showed on the diagram are the dire wolf, the silver fox, the gray wolf, and the coyote. And interestingly enough, our witness told us that the shape of the animal he was seeing and the size and the proportions were most similar to something between animals two and three, which are a silver fox and a coyote. And we haven't really known exactly what to do with that information. It's really a particularly striking answer because so much of what our witness describes doesn't really line up with the typical idea of the Wahila, but is also kind of a strange mismatch of other animals that are in the area. Uh, you know, the wolf-like actual description, the very, very light silver fur as opposed to the dark gray fur of wolves and, and silver foxes, and yet the game trail clearly being used by something like a silver fox, the supposed strange, almost lean features of the animal. We don't exactly know what it is that this witness is seeing. It's probably not the typical Wahila that people describe when they mean Wahila. But it is something that is uh, not exactly known. It's probably a common animal, and it's probably not a cryptozoological case per se, but the data on it's interesting nonetheless, and the actual identity of the animal is technically unsolved still. The ambiguous nature of the reported wolf makes the mystery difficult, but the supposedly small or slender build of the animal seems to rule out Canis dyrus, Amphisian, or even the modern wolf. What exactly the animal on the railway might be is unclear. Chances it is the classic Sandersonian version of the Wahila, though, are low. Perhaps sometime soon light will be shed on the nighttime carnivore.